You know, folks, this afternoon in that one question about if I had money, where would I put it? I, I went out on a limb and I was hoping I would uh, mention the different ministries that I'm aware of here in this room. And um, I failed to mention the great work that's being done down in Portsmouth, uh, Ferrum area, with uh, the Edwards family. Uh, they have um, had money in place to be able to purchase a building down there, and they will soon be opening the first uh, self-supporting Seventh-day Adventist church in England. Um, a building that they will, that the uh, the group down there will own and operate for the glory of God and the spreading of the three angels' messages. So, um, and I again, I apologize. I forgot about them, but they most certainly, for the work they're doing down there, they're most certainly worthy of your support. So. Having said that, let's take a look at our last meeting today, the 2520, importance for today. That last part down there, a lady came up to me one time at a meeting and she said, do you really think it's important for today? I said, I absolutely do not. Amen. I absolutely do not. So I said, I, I put that up there to try to stir people's minds to try to figure out what I was going to say. Well, folks, the 2520, as we begin this meeting, is a diversion, it's a distraction, and it's like all those other false teachings that have diverted the minds of self-supporting Seventh-day Adventists away from why we are here. And that is the proclamation of the three angels' messages through the Spirit of Prophecy books as we disseminate them as far and wide as we possibly can. So, the 2520, you say, well, Bill, you know, that's a nice comment. You've said that you don't agree with it, but let's prove it. Well, give me a little time. Let's take a look at this. <coughs> About three years ago, I am still on it actually, it's a women's ministry prayer line out of um, Glendale, California, sponsored by the Seventh-day Adventist Conference Church in Los Angeles. The lady who was running it was a woman by the name of Gwen Shorter. She's written several books on dress and diet. So she asked me one day, she called me on the phone, she said, would you do a talk on the 2520? And I said to her, I said, the what? What's that? I'd never heard of it before. And that was about two or three years ago. So, I told Sister Shorter, I said, Gwen, I will research this. I will find out where it came from. I will find out if there is biblical support for it. I will look in the spirit of prophecy to see where Ellen White mentions it, and I will do a talk on this subject on the prayer line. And so I did. I began researching the 2520, and this is what I found. There was a chart that William Miller and the Millerites came out with. It's called the 1843 chart. And, of course, it looks at the metal man of Daniel chapter 2. It looks at the, uh, the lion, the bear, the leopard, and the nondescript beast, and the little horn power in Daniel 7. 
It looks at the animals, the ram, the he-goat, the uh, little horn in Daniel chapter 8. Uh, it looks at the time prophecies. You see the time periods in Daniel chapter 12, the 1335, the 1290. Um, it looks at the 2300 years. It, uh, it looks at the 1260 years. And it also has a date up in the top, up here, called the 2520. Okay? So the 2520 was a time that the Millerites put on this chart in 1843. Now, let's read about that chart from Ellen White. Early Writings, page 74. She said this, I have seen that the 1843 chart was directed by the hand of the Lord that it should not be altered, that the figures were as He wanted them, that His hand was over and hid a mistake in some of the figures so that none could see it until his hand was removed. So Ellen White, if you notice this statement, and you read it, I'll leave it up there for a little bit. She says that the 1843 chart was directed by the Lord's hand. It shouldn't be altered. Okay? She says that, but she also said there were some of the figures were mistaken. She says that too. And she says, none could see it until God's hand was removed. And then the editors, they wrote in, this applies to the chart used during the 1843 movement and has special reference to the calculation of the prophetic periods as it appeared on that chart. Now I want you to notice something. Was the chart directed by God? Absolutely it was. Were there mistakes on that chart? More than one mistake on that chart? Yes, there was. And those mistakes would not come clear until God removed His hand. And then the Advent peoples would say, Oh, that's wrong. That's wrong. But I want you to notice the words that Ellen White used. She said some of the figures were wrong. Now, I taught English in school. Some is plural. It means more than one. Figures is plural. It means more than one. So there were at least two and possibly more mistakes on the 1843 chart. Now, obviously the one that stands out very clearly is this right here 1843 we know that the pioneers as they continued to study their Bibles they realized that Christ was going to come in October of 1844 correct? Yeah. so that's one of the figures that was mistaken 1843 was wrong now, what other figures were incorrect? If you watch the charts that were made by the Seventh-day Adventist pioneers from 1843, there was one in 1848, 1849, and there was a final one that came in around 1863, 1864. Okay, there were three charts. The only other figure that was removed finally with the 1863 chart, I believe it was 1863, the only other figure that was removed that was on this 1843 chart was this right here, the 2520. When you look at the chart that James White and the Brethren put out in 1863, the 2520 was removed. And of course, the 1843 had been changed already 
1844. Now those are the only corrections that are different in the 1863 chart. And Ellen White said some of the figures were a mistake. Now, those who believe in the 2520 today will, will read a quote like this in Manuscript Releases, volume 21, page 437. And they will use this quote to support everything on those charts. Listen to what Ellen White said. All the messages given from 1840 to 1844 are to be made forcible now for there are many people who have lost their bearings. The messages are to go to all the churches. Christ said, Blessed are your eyes, for they see, your ears, for they hear. For verily I say to you, many prophets and righteous men have desired to see those things which ye see and have not seen them. And to hear those things which ye hear and have not heard them. Blessed are the eyes which saw the things that were seen in 1843 and 1844. The message was given. There should be no delay in repeating the message for the signs of the times are fulfilling. The closing work must be done. A great work will be done in a short time. A message will soon be given by God's appointment that will swell into a loud cry. Then Daniel will stand in his lot to give his testimony. And so people that support the 2520, they read this and they say, all means every single message. And all does mean that. It means everything. However, Ellen White, Ellen White in her statement in early writings, page 74, said, there were some mistakes in the figures in some of those messages that were proclaimed. So folk, we need to be discerning. And I think that's one of the reasons why the 2520 just sweeps people off their feet. Is because number one, they want something sensational. And number two, they're not grounded. Now, the Millerites preached about a 2520 year time prophecy, but they didn't originate it. William Miller did not originate the 2520 doctrine. It was originated by a woman. Her name was Harriet Livermore. Livermore. Thank you, Christine. Harriet Livermore. And what she did was she studied the time periods which she thought were time periods, and we're going to see that in Leviticus 26. And she said, there's, there's 2,520 years, and those apply to the captivity of God's people from 677. And then she added 2,520 years, and she came to 1843. Now, why didn't the Millerites catch it? If I'm saying that it's not in the Bible, why didn't they catch it? I want you to think for a minute. Do you know how much opposition the Millerites were getting in America? Do you realize the publications, the newspapers that were going out proclaiming Miller to be a nut and all those who followed him to be crazy? Folk, they faced opposition like we can have never dreamed of. So this lady comes along with an apparent idea that seems to have support in the Bible, which it does not, and we will see it. So they grab a hold of it. They say, oh, this lady's with us. She, she has a prophecy that confirms that something's going to happen in 1843. Let's pull it. Let's use it. And so it goes on the 1843 chart. Ellen White apparently endorsed it in her statement in Early Writings, page 74, because she said the hand of the Lord guided the 1843 chart. But again, folks, we must 
be discerning. Yes, she said God guided that chart. But she also said there were mistakes on that chart. And the only two, again, that were not on the 1863 chart that were on the original in 1843 was the date 1843 and the 2520. So obviously the brethren in that 20 year period realized that, well number one, of course they knew that 1844 was right, but through study they recognized that the 2520 was not a biblical prophecy. They realized that. And that's why it was omitted in the 1863 chart. Now, we're Protestant Seventh-day Adventists. So that means that whatever doctrine we embrace, we must have a clear biblical base for what we believe. If we don't, folk, it needs to go. It's that simple. That's why this idea about women's ordination, where is it in the Bible? It's not there. It needs to go. Any idea that is not found in Scripture, it is a tradition of men. And it comes from Babylon. It needs to be discarded. So... We're going to have a clear biblical basis for whatever we preach, whatever we teach. So the 2520, it must be in the Bible if we're going to believe it and teach it. It has to be there. Ellen White's apparent endorsement of a doctrine is not a basis for any teaching. Okay? It's not a basis. Everything that Ellen White wrote, folk, as I tell people, Ellen White's writings are a telescope. They don't add stars into the sky. They simply point out the beautiful stars that are already there. That's what the spirit of prophecy does. Doesn't add, it simply reveals and says, if you studied that, this is what you're going to see. That's what the spirit of prophecy is for. <coughs> The chart mentions Leviticus 26 as the basis for the teaching of the 2,520 year time period. Now let's go to Leviticus chapter 26 and see what the Bible says. In Leviticus chapter 26, verse 18, verse 21, verse 24, and verse 28, there is reference to seven times. Seven times. We'll notice. Leviticus 26, 18. The Bible says, If ye will not yet for all this hearken unto me, then I will punish you seven times more for your sins. Leviticus 26, 21. If ye walk contrary to me and will not hearken to me, I will bring seven times more plagues upon you according to your sins. Leviticus 26, 24. Then will I also walk contrary to you and will punish you yet seven times for your sins. Leviticus 26, 28 then I will walk contrary to you also in fury, and I even I will chastise you seven times for your sins. Now, folk, as an English teacher, in English, there are different parts of speech, and each part of speech does a different thing in sentences and paragraphs and pages and so on. For example, a noun tells you uh, a person, a place, or a thing. Uh, a verb is either to be, it, it doesn't show action, like the word am, or are, or is. And then you have action verbs, 
like jump, run, throw, hit, eat. Those are action verbs. Well, in, this, in these verses right here, just looking at them in the English, that does not sound to me like a noun. And if we're going to deduce from these verses that we're actually looking at a time prophecy that is identifying 2,520 years, I don't get the impression just from looking at these verses that this is talking about a time period. I get the impression from just looking at it that it's actually talking about the severity of punishment that the Israelites would receive for their apostasy. So, just at face value, the word here, more, I'm going to punish you seven times more for your sins. It looks to me as though this is acting as an adverb here and adverbs tell you how, when, where, why, or to what extent. That's what an adverb does. This appears to be saying, because of their sins, God is going to punish them to this extent. It will be seven times more. That's the impression at face value that those verses, especially verse 18 and verse 21, gives to me. Now you say, well, Bill, I could care less about your English and about your adverbs and about what impression you have. I want to know from Scripture. I want to know from the Strong's Concordance. Is this a noun here describing a 2,520 year time period or is this talking about severity of punishment? That's fair. That's fair. Well, let's, let's look at this a little bit. The four references in Leviticus 26 in context seem to indicate the severity of judgment rather than a time period. William Miller and folk today believe that this seven times is a prophetic time period of 2,520 years. And this is how they deduce it. They say that Manasseh was taken into captivity in 677, and from there God's people were in captivity for the next 2,520 years. That's their deduction. But what does the Hebrew and the Greek Septuagint say? Well, James White, and I've gone back and you can do the same thing to your Strong's Concordance. And I'm going to tell you what I found. You can read it up there from James White. James White said that in Leviticus chapter 26, when you see the word times and you look it up in your Strong's Concordance or Cruden's Concordance, you will find that there is no definition for the word times in the Strong's Concordance. There is no definition for it, whether it's a literal year or whether it's showing severity of punishment. So what do you do then? Well. What you do is you go back to the word prior to, times, and that would be the word seven. If you look up the word seven from Leviticus chapter 26, Strong's Concordance has a definition for the word in, in the margin. So you look it up, and it says there that the word seven from Leviticus 26 when it's used with times, it is an adverb. Now that's what your Strong's Concordance will tell you. It does not say that the word times and seven times in Leviticus 26 is a time period. It does not say that. 
You can go back and check it in your Strong's Concordance. That's where I got the information. And that's what James White was saying. Now, let me illustrate my point to you. I want to take two stories from the book of Daniel. Two stories from the book of Daniel. The first story is in Daniel chapter 3. Nebuchadnezzar in Daniel 3 and verse 19. The Bible says, Then was Nebuchadnezzar full of fury, and the form of his visage was changed against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Therefore he spake and commanded that they should heat the furnace one seven times more than it was wont to be heated. Now, does that sound like Nebuchadnezzar heated the furnace for 2,520 years? No. <laughs> Doesn't sound like it, does it? What does it sound like? It sounds like he was going to bring greater intensity to the fire in the furnace. Interesting. You know what? If you look up Daniel chapter 3 verse 19 in your concordance, you will find that for the word times in the margin, there is no Hebrew word. So you have to go back to the word seven times more than it was wont to be heated. And if you look up the word seven for Daniel chapter 3 and verse 19, it will tell you the Hebrew word is Sheba, and it will tell you that when seven and times is put together in that verse, it means an adverb. That's what it says in the Strong's Concordance. So Daniel chapter 3, when Nebuchadnezzar heated the furnace, that was not a time period. That was showing intensity of the heat in the furnace. Just like we find in Leviticus chapter 26. Now, there's one other story in the book of Daniel. Daniel chapter 4. You remember in Daniel chapter 4 that Nebuchadnezzar went crazy for seven years. He went crazy for seven years, didn't he? And the Bible refers to those seven years. Notice Daniel 4 verse 16. The Bible says, Let his heart be changed from man's. Let a beast's heart be given to him. And let seven times... Pass over him. Now, does that sound to you, just reading it at face value, does that sound like severity of punishment on Nebuchadnezzar? Or does it sound like a period of time? Sounds like a period of time, doesn't it? Well, you know what? You go to your Strong's Concordance, you look up the word times in Daniel 4, there's a definition for the word times in Daniel 4. The Hebrew word is gidan. Gidan. And you know what the word means? It means a set time, a year. So folk, we have in the book of Daniel two different contrasting passages. One where seven times is showing the severity of the heat. And we have another representation in Daniel 4 where seven times represents a period of time. In Leviticus 26, the Hebrew phrase seven times in Leviticus 26 is identical to the use of seven times in Daniel chapter 3. It's identical to that.
That's what James White found and wrote an article for why they left out the 2520 in the chart in 1863. That's what he said, folks. Uriah Smith wrote an article and said, the 2520 in Leviticus 26 is not a time period. It's showing the severity of punishment the people would receive. That was why the 2520 was left out of the chart in 1863. James White wrote this commentary, the Adventist Review, January 26, 1864. His point, Leviticus 26, is not discussing a time period at all. It's declaring the intensity of punishment to be given for continual disobedience. Leviticus 26, the phrase for seven times, is an adverb. Seven times in Daniel 4 is a noun. Is a noun. And again, there's the statement in Daniel 3. Identical to the phrase in Leviticus 26. And obviously that's not a time period. James White's article, you can look it up on the internet, you can read it in its entirety. It's in the Review and Herald, January 26, 1864. It's right there on the computer. January 26, 1864. I'll just read this. He says, the Greek is equally definitive. The Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Old Testament, has in Leviticus 26, Heptachus, which is an adverb, signifying seven times. In Daniel 4, verse 16 and 25, we have not Heptachus, the adverb, but Heptachory, which is a noun and its adjective. In all cases where the word time occurs, denoting a prophetic period, as in Daniel 7.25 or Daniel 12 and verse 7 or Revelation 12 verse 14, it is from the noun karyos. Such a thing as a prophetic period based on an adverb is not found. That's silly, folks. Silly. So then, James White concludes, and I conclude as well, there is no prophetic period in Leviticus 26. It's not there. And those who imagine, and this is James White writing, those who imagine that such a thing exists and are puzzling themselves over the adjustment of its several dates are simply beating the air. To ignore or treat with neglect a prophetic period where one is plainly given is censurable in the extreme. It is an equally futile, though not so heinous a course, to endeavor to create one where no none exists. You say, but wait a minute, Bill, I, I thought we were only going in the Bible. Now you're quoting James White and Uriah Smith. Folk, they're just pointing out what's in Scripture. You go back to your concordance. You can read everything that has been said here today. When you look at the 1863 chart, it's not easy to see. I understand that. It's not easy for me to see, and I'm right up here next to it. But on the chart of 1863, the 2520 is not there. It's not there. Well, then somebody will say, and we read it already in early writings, they will only read part of her statement in early writings 74, and they'll say, but wait a minute, the 1843 chart Ellen White said was directed by the hand of the Lord. It should not be altered. The figures were as he wanted them, and then they stop. They stop right there. But Ellen White didn't stop right there. She said, 
His hand was over and hid a mistake in some of the figures. So that none could see it until his hand was removed. When God's hand was removed, 1843 was corrected. When his hand was removed, the 2520 was corrected. Now if we take if we take the fact, folks, that Ellen White apparently endorsed something, and we say therefore everything has to be right, that's real sketchy. Because Ellen White endorsed Martin Luther. But Luther taught he was a Sunday keeper. He believed in the immortality of the soul. He believed in predestination. So we can't just take one statement and say, well, if Ellen White endorsed, apparently endorsed something, therefore, it's got to be right. Got to be careful. In Ellen White's 70, 70 years of ministry, she never once, never once mentioned the 2520. Now I want you to think about that for a moment. The Bible doesn't refer to it. Ellen White never referred to it in 70 years of ministry. Who do we think we are to make it an issue among God's people? Inspiration doesn't discuss it. So why would we? Why would we? Yeah, we think it's new light. Yeah, yeah. In her masterpiece, The Great Controversy, in chapters 18 to 24, on the life of William Miller and his work, she never once mentioned the 2520. It's not there, folks. It's not there. She never once mentioned Harriet Livermore where this doctrine originated. She never once mentioned her. But Harriet Livermore was a very prominent speaker at that time. Why didn't Ellen White mention Harriet Livermore? Why didn't she mention the 2520? It's obvious why. Because it's not a biblical teaching. Amen. And if Ellen White is silent on a subject and the Bible is silent on a subject, I would think wisdom would be that we too should be silent on that subject. Amen. Amen. Yes. Great Controversy, page 351. Ellen White talks about the longest time prophecy in Scripture. Now, if we take the position that the 2520 is a time prophecy, well, folks, 2520 is longer than the 2300-year prophecy. Let's listen to how Ellen White talked about the longest time prophecy in the Bible. Great Controversy, page 351. The experience of the disciples who preached the gospel of the kingdom at the first advent of Christ had its counterpart in the experience of those who proclaimed the message of his second advent. As the disciples went out preaching, the time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God is at hand. So Miller and his associates proclaimed that the longest and last prophetic period brought to view in the Bible was about to expire that the judgment was at hand and the everlasting kingdom was to be ushered in. Now, folk, in the context of the longest and last prophetic period brought to view, Ellen White refers to a, pro a time prophecy and she says the judgment was at hand. What time prophecy tells us that the judgment is at hand. 2,300 days. The 2,300 days. Now Ellen White clarifies 
She said the preaching of the disciples in regard to time was based on the 70 weeks of Daniel 9. The message given by Miller and his associates announced the termination of the 2300 days of Daniel 8.14, of which the 70 weeks form a part. Folk, Ellen White is crystal clear what the last and longest time period is in Scripture. In the context of her statement, she refers to the judgment at hand, which is 1844, the 2300-year period. And then she makes it crystal, crystal clear when she talks about the termination of the 2300 days of Daniel 8.14. In the mind of the spirit of prophecy, the 2300 years is the last and longest time period. That being the case, what would the 2520 be? That's exactly what it is. It's a devilish diversion to get God's people sidetracked from the messages we are to proclaim. Amen. It's that simple, folks. The case of the judge. The lawyer walks into the courtroom without his client. He tells the judge there are nine reasons why his client couldn't be there. The first one, judge, is because my client is dead. The judge responded, you don't have to give me any more reasons. <laughs> Folk, if Ellen White and the Bible don't talk about 2520, what more reasons do we need? The 2520 is dead. It's a dead, it's dead. It was never a time period. And Strong's and the Hebrew bear that out very, very clearly. It's, it's not even a teaching in the scriptures. So how could we dare, how could we dare to go around and promote it as though this is saving gospel truth? Ooh. The 2520 is not a time period at all. It's a phrase denoting severity of punishment. She, Ellen White endorsed most of the 1843 chart, but she said there were some of the figures that were mistaken. She never once mentioned the 2520 in 70 years of ministry. Finally, the 2520 is a distraction of the devil to keep us occupied from teaching the three angels' messages of Revelation 14. It's that simple, folks. It's that simple. You know, in the Q&A, and I'll close with this, somebody was asking about the gospel for today. You know, Paul, in Galatians 1, talked about people who were bringing in a perverted message. And in Galatians, he talks about circumcision and the feast days. Well, folks, we've outdone the people of the first century. We've got a whole lot more perverted messages that we've got to watch out for. God help us to pray, to study, so that we can stand firm for those. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we thank you today for your word. We thank you today for the writings of Ellen White. We're thankful, Father, that as we see winds of doctrine just flying all about us, we're thankful that we can find the truth in, in the Bible. We can find the truth in what Ellen White said.
Father, I pray that you'd strengthen each one of us to study each day, to pray each day, to know in whom we believe, so that when we're called to testify for you, we can give an answer. Strengthen us. Help us to make those choices to plan our time so that we spend time studying, learning your will, sharing it with others. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. Amen.